We're starting a new series um, titled Thriving Family. And today we are talking about the first part of the series, Faith-Fueled Purpose in a Fast World. Faith-Fueled Purpose in a Fast World. We are living in a fast world, isn't it? Um, Richard Wiseman, uh, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Hertfordshire in the United States, he conducted a research that actually was trying to find which city is the most fast-paced city in the world. So the way they did this, they had a few metrics and parameters to evaluate the pace of people in a city. And one specific metric they used was actually literally how fast people walk. So they timed how long it took 35 people to walk 60 feet in an unobstructed flat path in their city center or anywhere. And they had data for this from 1994, and then they collected the same data in 2007 after you know, around 15 years. And what they found was two things. One was overall, the pace of people moved or increased by 20% in the same city that they did back in the 90s. And I'm, we are in 2024. If you extrapolate that data, I'm thinking probably it went up by 50% right now. And they did it for, and they have a table of the 31 fastest cities in the world. The first city is actually Singapore. And those of you who have taken breaks on your trip to Singapore or you've gone there, you know because in Singapore is mostly public transit and people walk everywhere fast. Some of the other faster cities are the cities in um, Western Europe. And uh, in fact, the only city in the US that comes in the list uh, somewhere is New York, which is the eighth fastest city. Because again, people walk everywhere in New York. And overall, the faster cities tend to be the ones in Asia or Europe. The slowest cities uh, where people are really chill was in the Middle East. Those from Dubai probably know that. They're probably still so chill. <laughs> but uh, I was actually not convinced about this data looking at life in Silicon Valley and here in the United States. And I thought, oh, they probably missed. Because here in the United States, we don't walk. We like to drive. We like to drive everywhere. We have to drive and find the nearest parking spot in front of Costco that has the minimal distance to walk. So they couldn't have gotten this data. I don't think people walk 60 feet on a flat surface anywhere in the United States. Maybe 10. So I think they didn't get the data. If they did, probably we would be topping this list more than any other city, and we could have gotten first place. But if you look at it, we all know that, especially in Silicon Valley, life is very fast. It's a very driven place. And what drives life here for us is this constant quest for the next big thing. Because everyone who works for whatever company you work for are driven by getting ahead of others in the race to be the first and to get the largest market segment in whatever the technology is. Right now it's AI, and everybody wants to be the first and ahead of everybody else. And so what happens then is these, this work culture where all these places that people here work for go and make these big promises or commitments to customers that they will have this product in 18 months before it is even designed. And I've been in meetings like that when I was in the tech world to my utter shock when my colleagues would just promise somebody uh, we're going to have this before we even have started designing it. And that becomes the next driving force. Then the, everybody is driven to do it, working overtime, working weekends, whatever it may be. So in essence, the purpose of that place you work for becomes your life purpose. It drives everything. And it has 
a cost that always comes with that, isn't it? You know, Fremont, they say, is the number one happiest city in the United States. Great to raise families. But if you look at some of the statistics that are published and not published about the mental health of people and children, and, and, and even though crimes are low, they are rising up, you can see it's really not that happy anymore. So how do families thrive? Well, if you are going to be on this pursuit of living for this purpose that whatever company you work for makes it yours, as a family, you cannot thrive. And families need to constantly pivot to what is God's purpose for me and my family. Because that has to be the foundation on which you build a healthy marriage, on which you build healthy parenting, and on which you live an overall healthy life. As this old adage goes, some of us have heard, families that pray together stay together. So that's where we want to talk about, before we go next week, we'll talk about marriage, and that following week we'll talk about parenting. But this week I wanted to talk about, if we want to thrive as families, let's get our foundations right. Let's get our priorities right. And what does God's word have to say about that? So I want to talk about three things this morning for us. First is thriving in our relationship with God, thriving in our fellowship with one another, thriving in our witness to those outside the church. So thriving in worship, that's the first thing it starts with. And Paul talks about that in the first two verses in Romans 12. We read as a call to worship this morning. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, some translations translated as tender mercies, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, here, after 11 chapters, Paul starts talking about a lot of commands or imperatives. But imperatives in the scripture always follow from indicatives, which are gospel truths. If we just take the imperatives disconnected from the indicative gospel truth, we are going to enter into legalism, we are going to enter into a works-based religion again in our life. So the key is to not miss the indicative here that Paul highlights, and as he's exhorting them, as he's appealing to them, and the indicative is, by the mercies of God. That's where all the commands follow from. And Paul has talked about the mercy of God in the first 11 chapters in this book that he has written to the church in Rome. In the first three chapters... He talks about what is the problem in this world, man's problem, our basic human condition, how all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and fallen short of the glory of God. How we are lost, and how that's the first step if someone wants to get back to God is confession. Sin, lostness, confession. That's the summary of Romans 1 to 3. Romans chapter 4 to 5, he talks about what is God's solution to this fallen condition of man. What is God's response to rescue us? He didn't just leave us like that. It is out of His mercy. He made a way to save us through faith. So the next three chapters are about salvation that we can find through faith. Gives us the example of Abraham and others. In Romans 6 to 8, God, Paul talks about God's provision of how He actually transforms us and sanctifies us and empowers us And it talks about Romans 6, reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. And Romans 9 to 11 talks of God's faithfulness, his sovereignty of how he has chosen you and me. And he ends all of this in a magnificent doxology. He's lost for words. You know, man's problem, God's solution, God's provision, God's faithfulness, all flowing from the tender mercies of God. And it is because of that, you and I now have a relationship with God. He wants us to live in union with this risen Christ 
and how God is living in us and His Holy Spirit is in us, and it is only as His Holy Spirit empowers us, you and I will be able to do all these things. But if we make these as a precondition to our salvation experience, we are going to enter into the same legalistic problem that the church has faced. And so he says, if we remember this, he says, through our union with Christ from His tender mercies and His Holy Spirit, we are now called to do what? Present our bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, living sacrifice is the imagery Paul is bringing up in this verse. You know, usually it's an Old Testament allusion to all the sacrifices people had to do if they committed a sin. But a sacrifice, once it's sacrificed, whether it's an animal or a dove or, 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 or a bull or a sheep, is dead. But he says for us, Paul says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. What he essentially is talking about is he wants our life to retain the qualities or the characteristics that was expected of sacrifices to continue and, and to have it as a lifestyle daily. So that begs the question, what was the characteristic of a sacrifice? How was an animal, a dove or a pigeon or a, or, or a bull or a sheep chosen that was fit for a sacrifice that could help them receive this mercy of God in the Old Testament. Now, the first thing about a sacrifice was it had to be set apart. You know, there was an intentionality. It had a purpose that it was chosen specifically to restore relationship. And in order to do that, they usually chose a lamb without blemish is what was usually looked for. You know? and, and he says, as he, he talks about us presenting ourselves, he highlights those aspects of the sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God. And, and what does the acceptable to God mean? It says that we live our life well, finishing God's purpose for our life, so he can tell us, well done, good and faithful servant, when we died. So the question before us is, is my life right now, if God looks at my life, will he say that my life is a living sacrifice? Am I intentional about my life displaying God's grace and mercy in living counterculturally? You know, one of the commentator beautifully puts this. He says, a Christ, and, and he says, this is your act of spiritual worship. And the word spiritual actually is translated as true worship. What basically he's saying is, you know, in the Old Testament, a sacrifice was just take, happened when people went to the temple. It was a local space, and it was done once, and they could go away with it. And that was worship. So here Paul is saying, worship is not just something that God is concerned about when you come to church on a Sunday morning. Worship is not just something that happens for 60 to 90 minutes on a Sunday morning. Worship is not something where you do your acts of sacrifice, whether you're giving your tithes or your offerings or your gifts to serve others on a Sunday morning. In fact, I want you to be a living sacrifice, which means I want this worship to happen 24-7 Wherever you are, in whatever you do. You know, this is what this commentator says. He says, Christian worship does not consist of what is practiced at sacred sites, at sacred times, and with sacred acts. It is the offering of bodily existence in the otherwise profane sphere. That as Christians, we don't retreat and hide and hunker down into our closed Christian bubbles... But wherever we are, even in the most profane places, he expects us to be a living sacrifice. So the Christian is therefore called to worship, which is not confined to one place or to one time, but it involves all places and all times. You know, the early church father, John Chrysostom, as he does his commentary on this, he talks about, and as he emphasizes, how you and I can be living sacrifices, 
carry over these characteristics of sacrifices, of being intentionally set apart, of, of being holy and blameless. This is what he says. And how is the body, it may be said, to become a sacrifice? Listen to this very carefully. Let the eye look on no evil thing, and it hath become a sacrifice. Let thy tongue speak nothing filthy, and it hath become an offering. Let thine hand do no lawless deed, and it hath become a whole burnt offering. You see, that's the calling you and I have to live as living sacrifices. One of the best imageries of this actually happens in the Old Testament with Abraham offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. And why did God make Abraham go through that? Why did Abraham have to go and offer his son as a living sacrifice. You see, the reason is, Paul actually talks about this in the very first chapter. What is the problem with all of us? The problem with all of us is we are very quick to exchange this knowledge of God to an idol. And then we follow those idols and whatever those idols ask us to do. And a sacrifice is supposed to reset and recalibrate that for us. For Abraham, because he never, they never had a child, having a child became an obsessive, idolatrous thing. Though God promised him, not just he's going to give him one child, that through him all nations will be blessed, he still got so obsessed over this one thing he so desperately wanted, and God had to reset that for Abraham. He, wa- he had to let Abraham walk through a living sacrifice moment just to show him that he's not supposed to worship the gifts that he receives, but worship the giver who was his God. It can happen to any of us. And that's where we ought to be aw- beware. What is it that we are attaching so much significance to in our life? Whatever it is that is our idolatrous thing that God knows, He wants us to reset and be a living sacrifice. Starts with our heart, spills into our actions, as Chrysostom said. What we speak, what we look, what we do, that's how you live a life of worship. Now, what is your one idol that causes your eyes and your hands and your hearts to say or do things that are not reflective of a living sacrifice. You know what that is. Whether it's work or education or marriage or relationship or children or how others perceive me or your own self. And that's where we want to start is to check this morning, is my life a living sacrifice? And as you exemplify that in your home and as as a whole family, you need to ask that question, does our family reflect a life of continual worship or living sacrifice? And he talks about this. The next was, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, the word conform and transform, it's not so rhyming in the originals. Because the transformation happens in our minds. It always is a battle for the mind. Starting from the Garden of Eden to Jesus when he was being tempted on the desert to when Jesus was even hanging on the cross. And so God says, how do you renew yourself You know, the transformation, the Greek word is metamorpho or metamorphosis. We have our discipleship program named after that when we started called metamorpho. It comes from these words. It comes from a renewal of our mind because what happened in Romans chapter 1, it says God gave them over to a debased mind. When they started going after these idols, God says, 
You want them better than me? I will let you have it and face the consequences and hit the end of the road. For some people, maybe that's what they need. But when we have Christ in us, he says, now you have the mind of Christ. We cannot become better people by a bunch of rules and regulations. He's not telling us, go back to the Old Testament and follow the law. He says, now you have the mind of Christ. You have the spirit of Christ living in you. And, and you, you need to rely on the spirit within you and renew your mind. It's a present continuous tense, which means it's a continuous daily activity. You know, sometimes for us, so you have many Christians, you grew up in a Christian church, you had this salvation moment or experience, you can tell at some point in your life, you just start slacking off. The life starts becoming more conformed to the people you hang out with most of the time, to the culture we live in most of the time. And it is anything but a living sacrifice. And this is a reminder. God says, you want a thriving family? Now, if you can't fix this relationship with God, if you can't fix the idolatry in your heart, if you are unable to live as a living sacrifice, don't expect your marriage to be great. Don't expect your parenting to be great. Don't expect your life to go great. You will get sucked into this fast world and follow the path of this fast world to a purpose that is not coming from God. And that's how we start, my dear friends. You want to have a thriving family? It begins with thriving in worship. What am I worshiping this morning? We all worship something. You heard me say that repeatedly several times in several sermons. I still think it's not enough because for every time you hear, you get bombarded 10 times the moment you step outside this church by counter messages that seek your heart for worship. You, worship, you can worship your boss, you can worship your job, you can worship your children. There are just so many things we can worship. But if you want a thriving family, you have to worship God and God alone because of His tender mercies that He gave for you and me. Secondly, let's move to the second part. It is about fellowship. You know, you cannot thrive alone. We need one another to thrive whether it's in our marriage, in our parenting, or in our work, or, or whatever our dreams and desires are in this life. And so Paul is actually foreseeing some concerns here of what can happen. You know, in a church like the church in Rome, this was actually an unusually good church. In Romans 15, he talks about how this church was a great church. They had modeled in love and done fantastic things. But it was also a, a, a high-powered church. Because it's in the city of Rome. What, what, what else can be more bustling than being in the city of Rome? It had people who were Jewish. It had people who were non-Jewish. And they were very smart people. And so when they come into the church, Paul has not seen them. He didn't even plant this church. But he's writing not just for them, but for any church in any large city. A church that is filled with people who are gifted and talented he foresees some of these problems can come and tendencies can happen and you do see them in many churches. The problem was not like, unlike the church in Corinth, these people were abusing their gifts, but what was happening was the exact opposite. There were three problems that were there in what is Paul addressing in this passage. And the first problem he is trying to talk about is that this is a church, when you have people with so many gifts, you can tend to be independent. You can tend to think that you can do it all by yourself. You know, we live in a place in this, in this country. For some of us, it's a new country we have come to. One of the core DNA of this country is excessive individualism and independence. And sometimes we can bring that into this church and say, I can fix myself, and, but there are no lone rangers within the body of Christ. You know, everyone needs someone, and that's the reason God has blessed the church with so many different gifts that are to be used to help us discover our purpose and to live and thrive. 
You know, a fictitious article published some years ago in the Springfield, Oregon Public School newsletter illustrates uh, a principle. And this is how it goes. It says, once upon a time, the animals decided they should do something meaningful to meet the problems of the new world. So they organized a school. They adopted an activity curriculum of running, climbing, swimming, and flying, call it the tetrathon. To make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took all the subjects. The duck was excellent in swimming, in fact, better than his instructor. But he made only passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. Since he was slow in running, he had to drop swimming and stay after school to practice running. You know, this caused his web feet to be badly worn so that he became only average in swimming. But average was quite acceptable, so nobody worried about that except the duck. The rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but developed a nervous twitch in his leg muscle because of so much makeup work in swimming. The squirrel, this is someone's favorite animal in our family, was excellent in climbing, but he encountered constant frustration in flying class because his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of from the tree top down. He developed Charlie horses from overexertion and so only got a C in climbing and a D in running. The eagle, problem, the eagle was a problem child and was severely disciplined for being a nonconformist. In climbing classes, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but instead insisted on using his own way of flying to get there. You see, this beautifully illustrates the problem here and how the church is supposed to operate. Each of us have spiritual gifts that God has given us, but we need everyone to allow everyone to come and minister into our lives so we can grow together. And the problem in this church was that, and what Paul foresees was, this is a problem in any church where people are so independent and do not want to let others come and meet with them. But then he talks about this imagery. He says, you know what the church is? And he uses an imagery so common, the church is like a body, the body of Christ. You know, in his uh, famous work, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, you know, international renowned surgeon, Dr. Paul Brandt, some of us know, he writes of the amazing diversity and relation, interrelationship of parts <clears throat> of the human body. Speaking of the body cells, he says this, <clears throat> He says, I'm first struck by their variety. Chemically, my cells are almost alike, but visually and functionally, they are as different as the animals in the zoo. Red blood cells, discs resembling lifesaver candies, voyage through my blood loaded with oxygen to feed the other cells. Muscle cells, which absorb so much of that nourishment, are sleek and supple, full of coiled energy. Cartilage cells with shiny black nuclei look like bundles of black-eyed peas glued together tightly for strength. Fat cells, as their name suggests, seem lazy and leaden, like bulging white plastic garbage bags jammed together. Bone cells live in rigid structures that exude strength. Cut in cross-section, bones resemble tree rings, overlapping strength with strength, offering impliability and sturdiness. In contrast, skin cells form undulating patterns of softness and texture that rise and dip, giving shape and beauty to our bodies. They curve and just at, unpredict and jut at unpredictable angles so that every person's fingerprint, not to mention his or her face, is unique. 
The king of souls, he says, the one I have devoted much of my life studying, and you will see why this is so important, is the nerve cell. It has an aura of wisdom and complexity about it. Spider-like, it branches out and unites the body with a computer network of dazzling sophistication. Its axons or wires carrying distant messages to and from the human brain can reach a yard in length. He says, my body employs a bewildering zoo of cells, none of which individually resembles the larger body. Just so, Christ's body, he says, comprises an unlikely assortment of humans. Unlikely is precisely the right word, for we are decidedly unlike one another and the one we follow. From whose design come these comical human shapes which so faintly reflect the ideals of a body as a whole. The body of Christ, like our own bodies, is composed of individual unlike cells that are knit together to form one body. He is the whole thing, and the joy of the body increases as individual cells realize they can be diverse without becoming isolated outposts. And Dr. Paul Brand was a missionary kid growing up in India, in the Kohli Hills in southern India. And he was the one who pioneered to work with leprosy, leprosy patients, and his research on nerve cells helped create first possible solutions to people who had leprosy and who were banned from coming and meeting people. There's an institute in Christian Medical College, Velour, that he was started that pioneered this research. And it was his research in nerve cells that was catalytic in all the advancements that came. And, and he not only was someone who did this research, people like him paved a big role in blessing the body of Christ in India. And he continues and asks this question, so what moves cells to work together? Why should these cells work together? What ushers in the higher specialized functions of movement, sight, and consciousness through the coordination of a hundred trillion cells? So the secret to membership lies locked away inside each cell nucleus, chemically coiled in a strand of DNA. And the DNA is estimated to contain instructions that if written out would fill a 1,600 page book. A nerve cell may operate according to instructions from volume four and a kidney cell from volume 25, but both carry the whole compendium. It provides each cell sealed credential of membership in the body. Every cell possesses a genetic code so complete that the entire body could be reassembled from information in any one of the body's cells. Just as the complete identity code of my body inheres in each individual cell, so also the reality of God permeates every cell in Christ's body, linking us members with true organic bond. And this is from his book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. It's a great book if you haven't read to take and read. You know, this was the first challenge that people had was when they had that giftedness, they wanted to do it all by themselves. The second problem that they had was, he talks about, for the grace given to me, I say to everyone, verse was, was three, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. You know, the second challenge was one is pride and, and thinking I can do it. The second was trying to compare their giftedness and trying to uh, desire what somebody else has instead of their own and being jealous and thinking, oh, that person's recognized, I'm not recognized. He says, that's not going to help you either. But really, he talks about the various gifts that he's talking about. The third problem that he talks about is one is people who are not allowing others to help them. Second is this challenge where people are too proud and are comparing and being jealous. Third is people not using their gifts. Because every single one of us has a spiritual gift. If you are 
a born again Christian. And he's not telling her how to find your gifts. You know, it's first spontaneous. The moment you're a new Christian, you start using those gifts. And you can find that out. You know, there are a lot of online inventories available today. If you want to go look up your gifts, you can talk to your small group leaders or ask me and we can help you do that. The problem is not knowing what is my spiritual gift. The problem is these people were not using it. They were just sitting and refusing to use the gift. So he says, whatever your gift is, use it and use it well. And that's why he says, he says, having gifts in verse 6 that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. There are like 20 to 25 gifts that are mentioned in the Bible in several places here and in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Peter 4. And there are many more. But if you don't use your gifts, you're not going to help others grow. And that's part of you discovering God's purpose. God's purpose for you individually and as a family comes and comes out together as you start using your gifts to serve others in any life situation. And at the end, he closes this section in verses 9 to 12 by saying it's actually at the end of the day, not about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, it says, let love be genuine. It's all about love. And the place you practice love is within this body of Christ. Why you use your gifts to help someone is not because you want to get a name for yourself. It's not because you want people to like you and follow you and only be friends with you. It's not because you can form your own small cliques and, and just be in the small cozy bubbles. He says, because it has to be out of love. You love someone and God is empowering you with a spiritual gift to help that person grow in their spiritual life. And so he lists almost 13 commands to follow that can help us unselfishly using our gifts in the church to serve others. He says, genuinely love others. Let your love be genuine. Hate evil. Do good to others. Love with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice. He just It's a rapid fire of a bunch of commands he gives them. Because that's how you love. That's how you show love. So my question to you, dear friends, is, I know some of you have been for a long time in our church, some of you have joined recently, and one of the things uh, we'd like to do is we'd probably have a Discover Spectrum soon. Part of that, we will help you find your gift. We don't want you to just come and be in our church and either be a consumer Christian or, or be an idle Christian or be an individual Christian. We want to help you discover your gifts and so you can start using that to benefit others. We want to encourage you to receive how others pour into you. We have people who are wonderful teachers. We have people, our deacons, who care and uh, go way out of their way to serve those inside and outside the church. You have wonderful elders who love the Lord, who pray and care for families. So my question today is to encourage you as a family to see how am I serving in the church? Am I using my spiritual gifts have I closed myself from others? Have I bottled it up and left it somewhere? Well, if you want to thrive, the thriving begins in the body of Christ first. And thirdly, it closes with thriving in our relationship with the world. Verses 14 to 21. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Live peaceably with all. And he goes on. You know, we live in a world that is growing increasingly hostile to the Christian faith. And we are at odds whether you work in 
whether you're at work or in your neighborhoods, especially in this political environment. It's a cancel culture, and if you hold one particular view with someone, you will not talk to you. And many of the issues that we care about as the body of Christ, the world does not. So how do we relate to people who hold a different position than us? Is it to hold these cars that you're going to burn in hell? It says no love. You have to bless and be a blessing wherever you are. It says rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. It says, which means get involved in the lives of the community around you, of your friends, and do life together. Just live in harmony as far as it depends on you. Be at peace with all. Associate with the lowly and 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 and, and he says, you want, if you want to thrive as a family, yeah, you want to thrive first in your worship, your relationship with God. You want to thrive in church and using your gifts. But you want to thrive in your community too. Because if your community thrives, you will thrive. As you know, we heard our retreat speaker encourage us. So the question is, where is brokenness in my community? In a five-mile radius where I live? Including those who may hold a different faith or a different belief than us. Where is, is there hunger? What is the thirst of my community? You know, where is the brokenness? Where can I use my gifts, my abilities, my time, my money, my resources to be a blessing? And a great place to do that, if you don't know what it is, is to go check out your library. You know, there will be a list of tasks for volunteers needed. You can start there. And this is the election season. You will probably have, wherever you live, people who are contesting in the elections come and talk to you. Ask them what they are going to do to fix the problems in your city. And some places have block parties or street parties. That's another wonderful place to get to know your community. You know, our neighbor would do this, and I've shared before, and as we participated, that's how we got to meet the mayor of our city. And he was talking about the plans and what's going to happen and what is the problem. I did not even know that. We didn't even know have that consciousness. And, and, and if you want to do more, you can either attend one or you start your own block party if you don't have one in your city. Because guess what? All these elected representatives and mayors will come to your house and you will have a chance to influence them so that your community can thrive. Is there a problem in your school district? The ranking is bad? Ask them why. Hold them accountable and offer to help. Because then you thrive. You also model to your children and, and others, and you can be a blessing. So those are three wonderful principles for us if we want to thrive as families Let's thrive in our worship. Ask ourselves, is my life a living sacrifice to God? And is my life representing the love and grace and mercy of God? And ask yourself, am I thriving in the body of Christ? Am I, am I slacked off? Am I you know, gotten into my shell, or am I letting others minister to me? And am I using my gifts to bless someone who may be in a bigger need than I within his body? And thirdly, the question to ask is, how can I be a blessing to my neighborhood? You know why we want to do all these things? It's because Jesus Christ was our living sacrifice. You know, he was sacrificed on the cross, and he still lives because he paid it all for you and I. We don't have to now go and do these things to earn brownie points with God. We want to do these things because Christ modeled it for us. He gave everything he had. He sacrificed everything he had for you and me on the cross. And he's alive, and he's in us, and he can empower us to do this. Because Jesus Christ gave his body to be broken away so you and I can be united in, as one body to represent this Christ to those inside the church and outside the church. And while he was on the cross, he prayed for the enemies, for the people who nailed him to the cross by saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. That was the attitude of Jesus 
even to the people who nailed him to the cross. That's the kind of love our world needs today, my dear friends. And God is calling us to do. You know, there is this old saying I heard in a youth retreat, you probably did too, says that the Bible will keep you away from sin or sin will keep you away from the Bible, isn't it? It's very true. You know, I can't remember how many time after times I've met with very successful people in the Bay Area. There's a family who are very successful serial entrepreneur. They own three homes in the Bay Area. You know how hard it is to even buy one home? They own three homes in the Bay Area. But the sad reality is the father lives in one home, the mother lives in another home, and the son lives in the third home. How do you think the father feels at the end of his working day, coming into this empty house, which is huge in space, but empty with people? Well, that's what happens if you follow the purpose of this world. Now, I was speaking to another successful business leader, and he shared this in a very private moment in a conversation. He said, JP, I don't know why my son is very angry. He doesn't talk to me. I don't think I did anything wrong. I gave him everything he needed. I still don't know why. I wish our relationship can be different. You see, my dear friends, these are signs that we see when you have left all these fundamental foundations did not give significance to that. So it's time for us to wake up and be on guard to first start thriving in worshiping God. It's a constant, daily, continuous practice. And how do we do it? If there's a simple way to do it, you know, I, I, I like um, Pastor Chip Ingram. He has this acronym, um, I just boldly steal, and he will not have a problem with that. He calls it bio, B-I-O. What is the bio of a Christian? He says, this is how you do it. B stands for before God daily. He says, meet with him personally through prayer and his word to enjoy his presence, receive his direction, and follow his will. It's a very simple characteristic. I stands for do life in community weekly. You know, structure the week to personally connect in safe relationships that provide love, support, transparency, challenge, and accountability. You know, this is not, when we talk of uh, community or fellowship, we're not just talking about getting together and having just a good jolly time and not really sharing or letting one another in our lives. We want to have those good times, but are you humble enough to go and ask for help when you need help? To be challenged, to be held accountable. We need this. I need this every day in my life. So do life in community. And O stands for be on mission 24-7. Just cultivate a mindset to live out Jesus' love for others through acts of sacrifice as well as service at home, work, play, and church. That should be the bio of every Christian. Before God daily, in community, on mission. That should be our DNA if we want to have thriving families that will reflect God's call for us. Shall we pray and ask God's help to thrive in these areas of our life? Let's pray.